Hello, everybody, and welcome to All Hands on Tech Live. And I've got a little bit of an echo here. There we go. Fixed it. So today I'm really excited to start a new series. Now, we've been doing these live streams every week for quite a few months now, and we've done a lot of stuff with Blazor and .NET, and it's been a lot of fun. But we're going to take a little break, and we're going to jump into some other uh, more fun stuff, maybe, for some people. Uh, for me, I think it's going to be more fun. Uh, something different. We're going to build some JavaScript games. And the way we're going to do that is um, I actually uh, don't know how to build a JavaScript game. I've never done it before. That's what makes this exciting. So with the Blazor and .NET stuff, it's like, yeah, I've been writing those applications for years. I know a lot about it. Um, it's pretty easy to walk through. But uh, as far as what we're doing now, we're going to build a game with Phaser and we're going to learn together. So I'm going to go through some of the Phaser tutorials. Of course, we're going to go off tutorial a little bit and play around with things. And we're going to learn how to build video games in JavaScript. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. We're going to learn together. Um, I figure we'll do some streams where we go through these tutorials. We talk about things, uh, answer questions, things like that. And then, of course, we're going to build our own game. So we'll build some kind of uh, game. I haven't decided whether it's going to be like a platformer or it's going to be uh, maybe a roguelike game. I haven't quite decided yet, but we're gonna build that game together here live on stream. So it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be fun, and I can't wait. So I'm gonna do a quick tech check really quick. And Maniza, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you for coming to the stream from LinkedIn. Where can I watch a recording of this? You can watch a recording on our YouTube channel. So I will send you a quick link and this will be recorded on YouTube for your enjoyment if you're not able to watch everything right now. So let me jump in here. There we go. YouTube.com slash plural site. And under the All Hands on Tech live section, you'll see uh, recordings of both mine and David's streams. You're welcome. So I'm going to make sure that we are live right now everywhere else. Obviously, we're live on LinkedIn. And it looks like we're live on Twitch. We're here on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We've got a bunch of people on LinkedIn. And I think we're live on Twitter today, too, because I, uh, I did tweet it. And the Pluralsight.com account tweeted it. So let me check and make very sure that we are live there. Okay, yes. Hello, uh, 12 viewers from Twitter. Very cool. Is there any prerequisites for this tutorial? Yes, uh, but they're all free. So what we're going to do is I'm, I have the screen up here. And I will share that link. Also, this is a tutorial we're going to take today, and it's using the Phaser framework. So you are going to have to have Phaser, and you're going to have to have a web server installed. So we're probably not going to go through all of that. What I'm doing is using WebStorm, which has a built-in web server in it, but you could use something like Serve from Node. I'll see if I can find a link for that. So if you have Node.js, you can run something called server.js or serve. Um, let me see if I've got it here. Yeah, it is. We'll allow this. So with serve, if you type npm uh, install dash g serve, uh, serve will serve this up. And this is just HTML and JavaScript that we're doing today. So there's not a ton of dependencies with that. For the most part, you need a web browser and you need uh, a code editor. So what it says in here is, you know, it kind of goes through and says download the zip file, which contains each step of this tutorial. I've downloaded this zip file. I'm going to open it up and extract it all here into phaser test, which is the name of my folder that I'm creating today. Like I said, we're gonna just do this together. Looks like there's 10 parts. I doubt we'll get through all 10 parts today, 
but we can try. And I'm doing it in Windows today. Here's what's cool about this uh, this kind of development is you can do it in anything. You could do it in uh, yeah anything. Windows, Linux, Mac. I'll probably be doing it on a Mac actually the next time I do this, but today we're doing it on Windows. So it says download the zip file which contains each step of the tutorial. Let me just drag this over here and we'll look and see what we have in our uh, bundle here. So we've got a few PNG files looks like in our assets. We've got part one through 10 and it looks like we're probably using phaser externally if I had to guess, yeah. So right here we're serving phaser through a CDN, which is fine. It's a, it's a pretty good way to do things most of the time if you're just goofing around like this. If you're actually building a real game, you'll probably want to download it. And let's just load up your first phaser game. Looks like uh, it doesn't load up anything here. So that's fine because we haven't gone through the tutorial yet. So <clears throat> says you need to have a very, very basic knowledge of JavaScript, which I think is great. If you don't have a very, very basic uh, knowledge of JavaScript, you can go to javascript.com. And we've got some cool stuff on here. We've got some free courses on JavaScript. And I will put that comment in here. Um, how do I find this live course on LinkedIn? Um, I'm not really sure. I, I'm not familiar with LinkedIn Learning um, where you can find live courses. This is just uh, basically a live stream that I'm doing on LinkedIn and you can download it on YouTube later. Um, if you want to go, I'm going to do kind of part one through whatever, however long we go. But um, yeah, if you're not super familiar with JavaScript, javascript.com has a bunch of cool stuff. Like you can type in Jamie and hit enter. Oh, I suppose I should do it like this. Next challenge. And then it goes through all these different challenges. By the end of it, uh, you can learn quite a bit of JavaScript. And we're adding more stuff to javascript.com every day. So keep an eye on that. Now let's look through here and it says open the part one HTML page, which we did that. And let's have a closer look at the code. After a little boilerplate HTML, it says, that includes phaser code, structure looks like this. And we have a config variable. We have phaser.auto, width 800, height 600, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. That's going to be our, our window size. And we can change that just to, um, just to see what it looks like. So pressing play here, whoops, that overwrote the different window. We'll go here. Um, highlight, did I close that? I do believe I completely closed that window, which is fine. I'll switch to this one. I thought, okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, Go to this current file here, go here. And I don't see any window on it yet. So when we do see a window, we'll change the size of it and we'll see how that works. Um, looks like, oh, we've got quite a few viewers today, which is exciting. It's pretty awesome. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you, all 64 of you. It looks like that is very cool. I will keep the chat open for any kind of questions you may have. So in part one of HTML, it says the config object is how you configure your phaser game. So there's lots of options that can be placed. We can kind of see these options here. We can see the width and height. Um, hello, Juan. Thank you for joining. Um, what's the difference between JavaScript.com and Pluralsight? Um, Pluralsight owns JavaScript.com, and we're using that. That's going to be our vehicle for, uh, we're really going to try to increase JavaScript learning 
on that site. And so we've got a lot of stuff on there to where people can just jump on and learn for free. And it's just kind of a, it's a community type thing where we're wanting to help out the community and we're going to add more stuff to it. It's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be pretty fun. So the config object, we can kind of see these options in here. Some of these, we don't know what they mean. Uh, and Yvonne says, also a good resource is Node School. It's free and all in console. Yeah, I've never tried out Node School, but um, yeah, if they have a, a console-based learning thing, that's, that's definitely cool. So some of these, I don't know what they mean. Obviously, uh, type, phaser, auto, I can only make assumptions. I know what width and height is. Scene, we have preload, create, update, update. And I can see these three functions down here. <clears throat> we can make some assumptions right now and, and probably assume that preload is stuff that's loaded before it starts. Create is probably run one time as you go. And an update is probably our game loop. So if you've done any game programming, there's always a game loop that runs. It usually runs once per frame, and that's where it checks to see if there's user input. It moves things, all kinds of, of fun stuff there. So there are lots of options. Uh, an instance of phaser game object is assigned to a local variable called game. So that's something that we need to remember is uh, there's going to be a local object called game right here. Var game equals phaser game. Oh, well, on, uh, yeah, you can click on the links that say free courses, and those courses should be included in your Pluralsight subscription if you have one. So it's the basic uh, JavaScript courses kind of from the start, kind of from the beginning all the way up to advanced. And, of course, um, we have a lot of really advanced JavaScript courses on there also. So this is our game object. Far game equals new phaser game. We don't really know what to do with it yet. It's not being used, but I assume this tutorial is gonna tell us what we can do with that game object. So in phaser two, we don't care about phaser two, we're not using it. The type property can be phaser canvas, phaser webgl, or phaser auto. So that's something that we can change. Maybe that's why I'm not seeing it. Maybe I need to draw up a canvas or a webgl. Um, phaser auto automatically tries to use WebGL, but if the browser or device doesn't support it, it'll fall back to Canvas. The scene property of the configuration will be covered in more detail. That's great, because I don't know exactly what it means. Let's load the assets we need for our game. You do this by putting in calls to the phaser loader inside of a scene function called preload. So that's the one that we assumed preloads things before we start. And we can see here, that these correspond to the assets that we have here. So we could even, like in WebStorm, we could drag these in, but we'll copy and paste. And we have this load image, sky, ground, star, bomb, and then a sprite sheet, which, hmm, let's load sprite sheet. For some reason, uh, WebStorm doesn't like that, but we'll see. We'll see if we fix it or not. And so we're loading in assets here. And this is Sky PNG, Bomb PNG, etc. I don't remember if I can. Yes, I can open them here in Windows. Let's just take a look at these really quick and see what they look like. So we've got Bomb PNG. Very small. Dude PNG looks like it's a sprite with a little player. And so with these sprites, what they do is, is they load in. This is very common in JavaScript and other types of gaming systems. Is you build one image. And like this image, you can see the player is facing you. Here they're turned to one side, walking. And what we do with those is we chop them up into little tiny maps and then switch that map. And because they're all in one basic file, it becomes really fast. This one is platform PNG, pretty self-explanatory. And then we have a star. So these are our assets. And we're loading them up right here. Let's go to the next part of the tutorial. This will load in five assets, four images, and a sprite sheet. 
may appear obvious to some of you, but I'd like to point out that the first parameter, also known as the asset key string, is a link to the loaded asset and what you'll use in your code for creating game objects. So that's this part right here, sky, ground, star, bomb. Very cool. You're free to use any valid JavaScript string as a key, of course. Now, in order to create to display one of the images we've loaded, place the following code inside the create function. So this is where we're going to add the sky. So now let's see if we're going to put this in the create function. We're going to save it. Now let's see if we're able to see something on our screen. Which so far, not so much. So it could just be a web storm issue here. And we can try to use serve like I mentioned earlier. We'll go in here to phaser test, type in serve. And then I'll go to localhost 5000. I believe it's port 5000. Oh, it's 3000. Localhost 3000. There's all our assets. We're looking at part one.html, and part one still does not work. So we will try this, try this out here. Let's jump into our console and see if we are having some sort of problem. Failed to load resource. Oh, it's not loading phaser JS. So how do we fix that? That one is not really our fault. This right here is not loading up, which it probably says something. Download library, we can try to download library. It says it fails to drive, fails to download it. So this library that we're trying to get from the CDN is not downloading, and that's why we're not seeing a screen. So let's see if we can just download it. Invalid URL. So let's we'll Google phaser download, and we'll download it ourselves. Discover features, make game and publish, etc. Download as a zip or fork it. Okay. So here we have npm. We can do an npm install. We have CDN, which we know the CDN that is in their example file doesn't work, but let's try the CDN that's on their website. Whoops. This one has a version in it at least, so this one might work. And it does not. But it doesn't look like it's a CDN problem this time. We're looking in our our console here. It says multiple readback operations. Read frequently set after it. Two unexpected token. So that's probably a typo. See where our unexpected token is. Big script type. Okay, let's try with WebStorm. Part one dot HTML line fifty one, which is right here. So it is not enjoying this because this is incorrect. So oops, let's stop this really quick. And what I did was, as you saw, I just downloaded it from their tutorial site. And it looks like on the tutorial site, the site that they give in for part one HTML has a script tag outside of the image tag. So that's definitely uh, a problem. Now it's working. So that's one of the notes that I'll have to make and send it to the, the phaser team and let them know that that... Uh, but that's a problem.
in their little file that they sent from, uh, or the file that's in the tutorial is not correct. <clears throat> so here we are, we've got part one. And we're ready to go. Now I don't think I need to run serve anymore. So we can close this. We'll leave the terminal there just in case we might need it, but um, we shouldn't need serve anymore. Should be able to just click this and go. And quick tech check really quick. Yep, we've got a ton of viewers today, which is great. Okay, we, we got it to work. Um, it basically was a, there was a script tag in the wrong place in the code that we downloaded. So let's jump back to the tutorial. And it says you can find this in part three HTML. We didn't need to, we just put it in there. Now here's something interesting. It says the values 400 and 300 are the X and Y coordinates of the image. Why 400 and 300? Because in phaser three, all game objects are positioned based on their center by default. So this is something I think is really important for us to know is that background image is 800 by 600. But if you notice, we put add image 400, 300 because we want that in that center of the image. So this is pretty important information they're giving out here. I mean, I had kind of assumed that, but I wanted to read it. It says, hint, you can use set origin to change this. For example, the, this add image sky 00, zero set orange 00, zero, will reset the drawing position to the top left. So that's that is pretty interesting. I don't know why we'd need to do that, but let's try it. So in our part one here, we had this, let's change it to this, set origin zero, zero, and see what that one looks like. Very good. And I do see a little bomb over there on the corner, so we'll We'll find out what that's all about. So we'll go back here. The order in which game objects are displayed matches the order in which you would create them. <clears throat> so if you wish to place a star sprite above the background, you'd need to ensure that it's added as an image second after the sky image. So let's do that. Let's put a star there in the middle of the screen. And there it is. There's our little star in the middle of the screen. So perfect. Now we'll go here. If you put star image first, it'll be covered up by the sky image. So that makes sense. You know, you're kind of stacking it in layers. Under the hood, this dad add image is creating a new image game object and adding it to the current scene's display list, which is where all your game objects live. You could position the image anywhere and Phaser will not mind. Of course, it's outside of the region 00, zero to 800 by 600. You're not going to see it because it'll be off screen. And it says here, the scene itself has no fixed size and extends infinitely in all directions. That's super important because if we're looking at this, um, and we put this star somewhere over here, we're not going to see it, but we might want to put it over there. Like if we're building a side scroller, a lot of the side scrollers will have an image that is really, really, really wide. And then the viewpoint is just a small portion of that image and it slides along. And that'll make a little bit more sense when we start digging into this, but that makes sense. Screen itself has no fixed size, etc. That's pretty important stuff to know. For now, let's build up the scene by adding a background image and some platforms. Cool. Here's the updated create function. So we're gonna do this add image sky, which we already did. Then it looks like platforms, well, this 
physics add static group, which we'll find out what a static group is if we keep going here, I'm assuming. And then platform create ground, set scale to refresh body. Also, I do not know what any of that means, but we'll find out. And then it looks like we create ground in several different spots. So let's just dump this in here and see what it looks like. Remove all this. Now we're moving our sky. We've got some platforms and it looks like we're creating several different ground things. And I don't see anything different. Let's jump in the console. Cannot read properties of undefined reading add. So this is in the create function. And I didn't put in var platforms. That's probably why it's not creating anything. So let's just copy and paste this entire thing here. Var platforms. Function create. This add image. Platforms create. Void return value used. Void function return value used has no quick fixes. So yeah, interestingly, this part of the tutorial does not work either. Cannot read properties of undefined reading add. So we're probably going to have to add some more stuff here. Because it says they'll call this physics, this means we're using the arcade physics system, but we can but before we can do that, we need to add it into our game config to tell phaser that our game requires it. So let's update that to configure or to include physics support. So here's the revised game config. And it looks like we're adding in physics right after the height and width. Up here, we've got height, width. We're adding it before the scene. And I didn't copy that correctly, did I? There we go. Now we've got an arcade object. Maybe that will help. With, yes, it does. There we go. Now we've got our platforms here, which is cool. And actually, I might as well just leave, leave the inspector open. Even though we're seeing some warnings here, and it's probably uh, audio context is not allowed. Canvas. To, most of these are probably stuff that we can kind of ignore for now, and then we'll we'll jump in there as we go through these tutorials, and we'll probably figure out. We're probably not using best practices because this is a tutorial, and we'll find out soon. The new addition is the physics property. You'll find in part four HTML, you should see a much more game-like scene. So this does look like what we're looking at now. And we can go and maybe we'll add a, another platform just for the heck of it. And I'm not really sure where I'm at in the space here, but we'll say uh, 100 and 250. Like 100 and 350, I don't know. Yeah, and there's more platforms. So we added this one right here. Just uh, one very simple line of code. But we're going to stick to the tutorial for now. So it's backed like this, which is great. And I just wanted to say to everybody watching, we are always on Twitch. Follow us on Twitch. This is where all of our live streams go all the time. Sometimes we're on LinkedIn. Sometimes we're on YouTube. Sometimes we're on Twitter, etc. But we are always, always on Twitch. So we always want people to follow the Twitch channel to see every single stream. We've got a couple of events happening uh, this year that we're going to have some really cool folks come on to live streams. We're going to talk to them and interview them about stuff. Um, we do two different shows. David Neal does a show also on JavaScript and programming. He does his on Thursdays. I do mine on Tuesdays. So you definitely want to check it out. And if you message us on Twitch, we'll send you a cool sticker pack. So 
just uh, send us a message at Twitch or email me, jeremy-morgan at pluralsight.com, and I will send you some really cool stickers for your laptop. Awesome stuff. All right, we've got a backdrop and some platforms. How exactly are these platforms working? <clears throat> now, I'm assuming that these platforms aren't just uh, silly images, right? Because we basically... Uh, we can put images on there for looks, but I think because we imported that physics stuff, that I think it's going to be something that you bump into, right? So let's find out by looking at it. We added a bunch of our code that deserves more detailed explanation. Good, because we don't know what this means. <laughs> right? I remember I said, uh, look at this, I don't know what this is. Uh, so this is gonna explain it. This creates a new static physics group and assigns it to local variable platforms. In arcade physics, there are two types of bodies, dynamic and static. A dynamic body can move around via forces such as velocity or acceleration. So that's, I'm assuming something like enemies that can move around. And then a static one, it can, um, doesn't move, it sits there, but you bump into it. So as it isn't touched by gravity, you can't set velocity on it, but when something collides with it, it never moves. So, good stuff. But what is a group? As their name implies, there are ways for you to group together similar objects and control them all as one single unit. You can also check for collision between groups and other game objects, which is cool. That's something that we are gonna wanna do. We're gonna wanna check for physics. Um, we're gonna wanna check for collisions and make sure that we're not colliding into things. So when we go on that platform, we want to make sure that like we're sitting on top of the platform instead of flying through it. So that's why I think it's going to help us here. A physics group will automatically create physics enabled children, saving you some legwork in the process, which is cool. With our platform group, we can now use it to create platforms. So we created a platform and it looks like we're adding these and these are children. During our preload, we imported a ground image, the simple green rectangle, 400 by 32, will serve our basic platform needs, which is cool. The first line of code above, that's this one here, adds a new ground image at 400 by 568, and remember their position based on their center. So this one was 400 and 568. The problem is we need this platform to span the full width of our game, otherwise the player will just drop off the sides. So to do that, we scale it times two with set scale two. Okay, that was one of the things that was kind of a mystery to me, was the set scale two. And it's right here. So that's one of the things I was wondering, like what does set scale two mean? And according to this, that is because we set this platform to go from the center out 400 pixels. If we scale it by two, then it'll cover the entire screen which is awesome. Uh, let's go to the next one that we created here and let's just set scale two on that one just to see what it does. Okay, and I'm gonna save it. And it looks like it made it twice as big. What if we set scale to four? Now it's enormous. So that's pretty cool. That's something that we can definitely keep in mind later. One of the things I think that would be kind of cool is to make the enemies scale, right? So make them bigger, like as you approach them or something, they all of a sudden become bigger. I don't know. I'm always thinking of ways to make these uh, games more interesting and playable. So the ground is scaled in place, so it's time for the other platforms. The process is exactly the same as before, but we don't need to scale these because they're the right size already. Three platforms are placed across the screen, the right distances apart to allow the player to leap up to them. Now comes the exciting part. We're gonna add the player. We've got some lovely tempting platforms, but no one to run around them. Let's rectify that. So create a new variable called player and add the following code to the create function. So we're gonna create a a player and it's going to say this physics add and we're going to add a sprite. Now if you've never done game development before um, you may not know what a sprite is but we will explain it and it is a really cool concept that it's not just for JavaScript games it's for games all over the place. 
So we need to create this up here. We'll create it after the config because we're loading in that physics stuff. So this physics adds Sprite. That Sprite's name's Dude. We've got a couple of things here. And we can kind of make some assumptions. It says player set bounce at point 0.2. I'm guessing that this player jumps. And if the player jumps, then they'll bounce. I could be wrong. Collide world bounds true. That one, I'm assuming, is our collision detection, which means the boundaries around this sprite will collide with other physics objects like that platform. And then we've got add the following code to the... Oh, we're supposed to add this into the create function. So let's just copy all of this. We'll put it in create. I was creating this outside of create, which we do not want to do. So we'll go in here because we want to follow this, follow these instructions to a T. And I'm going to throw in some, um, let's see, our group of platforms. And then on the next one, I'm going to say ground level scaled 2x. Whoops. I don't know why I put three. Scaled 2x. So ground is completely covered. And I'm just going to throw some comments in here so that we don't kind of lose track of it later. We'll say additional platforms. And then this. Whoops. I don't know why I did that. We're going to put our player. So sometimes, you know, comments can really help, especially like this. We don't know what we're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe you're watching. Maybe you know Phaser really well and you know exactly what I'm doing, but I don't really know what I'm doing. So I want to put in every time I learn something new about something, we'll put it in the, the uh, comments so that later when we jump back into this code, it'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. This is the player object. <clears throat> so here... We're creating some things, and I can make some assumptions about this also. So this anims, anims is another object that we're going to have to create, I'm sure. Key equals left, so I'm guessing that's the left arrow key. We're going to generate frame numbers from dudes, start zero and three. So that's where I was talking about the sprite and how the sprite sliced up. That's what I think we're doing in here. Turn, we're going to use frame four. Create key right means dude's going to go right using frames five through eight. And so we did look at that in assets. We looked at our dude here. Let's do that again. Uh, open an explorer. And so here I'm assuming these frames are like zero, one, two, three, four, etc. And so we're just calling those frames as we make the dude walk. It says there are two separate things going on here. The creation of a physics sprite and the creation of some animations it can use. The first part of the code creates the sprite. We talked about this. Puts a player positioned at 100 by 450 from the bottom of the game. This sprite was created via the physics game object factory. So if you know what an object factory is, um, that will make a lot more sense. But basically, we're just kind of creating this new object. It's a new instance. And um, yeah, it says it has dynamic physics by default. Sprite's given a slight bounce of 0.2. This means after jumping, it will bounce ever so slightly. So that was a cool assumption, right? And actually, I haven't taken this tutorial yet, which is why we ran into problems earlier is because this is, this is my first time taking this tutorial. I was going to take it and go through all of them and build it and all that. But then I thought, well, it's kind of it's kind of phony, right? Like if I come in here and say, hey, let's check out this new tutorial that I've already taken and I already know everything about it. I thought it'd be pretty phony. So uh, I decided to wait till just now to do this. I don't actually know where this tutorial is going and how, uh, how long it's going to take either. But at least we're both going through it at the same time. Glance back to the preload function, you'll see dude was loaded as a sprite sheet, not an image. 
That's because it contains animation frames. This is what the full sprite sheet looks like. There are nine frames in total, eight for running left, one for facing the camera, and four for running right. Note Phaser supports flipping sprites to save on animation frames, but for the sake of this tutorial, we'll keep it old school. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but uh, it's, it's basically a note that says we're keeping it old school, so we're keeping it old school. We defined two animations named left and right. We did that. In Phaser 3, the animation manager is a global system. This is another note, or it's actually extra info. We want the extra info, right? We want the extra stuff to know here. Animations created within it are globally available to all game objects. They share the base animation data while managing their own timelines. This allows you to define a single animation once and apply it to as many game objects as you require. Now that is really cool. This is different to Phaser 2 where the animations belong specifically to the game objects. So yeah, that's really cool that you can add these animations. So basically what they're saying is we can create another dude um, and apply the same, same exact animations to it, which saves you time and code. Now we're at part six, body velocity, a world of physics. And this was written in, I just noticed this was written in 2018. So it's quite an old tutorial, but it seems to be, seems to be good for now. So it has support for a wide variety of different physics systems. I'm not gonna read this whole thing off to you. We're just gonna try to figure it out. When a physics sprite is given a body property, which is a reference to the arcade physics body, represents the sprite as a physical body in Phaser's engine. So that means something that bounces around and does stuff. To simulate the effects of gravity on a sprite, it's as simple as body set gravity. It's an arbitrary value, but logically, the higher the value, the heavier your object feels, the quicker it falls. If you add this code to your code or run part five HTML, you'll see the player falls down without stopping, completely ignoring the world we created earlier. Oh, because we're not testing between collision and the player. So right now, oh, that's correct. And I just noticed our arrow keys aren't really working, right? I, like not as we expect, which is fine. But we haven't gotten that far yet. <coughs> but we've gotten pretty close. Because I can see we have some some animation creation going on here. So we'll just keep uh, jumping in. And it says right here, it told us what was gonna happen. You'll see the player falls down without stopping, completely ignoring the ground we created earlier. We're not testing for collision between the ground and player. So here we can add a collider. Now, if you've done programming in other frameworks, uh, game creation, I should say, and other frameworks such as Unity, um, some other different, uh, add URL of tutorial, please, in our chat. I will do that very quick here. And there is our tutorial. And I forgot since we're on LinkedIn, I have to add that separately, don't I? Uh, bear with me for just a second here. And I will add that to the LinkedIn chat. There we go. So this is the tutorial that we're working on right now. We're, we're kind of far into it, but there we go. Now the collider, as I was saying, if you've done other game development in other languages, even C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, whatever, um, the collider is kind of a common name for something that collides with other objects, right? It does collision detection. It says it takes two objects and tests for collision and performs separation against them. In this case, we're giving it the player sprite and the platforms group. It's clever enough to run collision against all group members. So this one will collide against the ground and all platforms. So let's add that in. Where did it say to add the collider? That part I don't remember. We'll just guess and say it's within the create group. 
Oops. We'll add our collider. We'll go back to our thing. Oh, there we go. And as you can see, our player falls. But I still don't see any player controls. But that may be a further, further part of the tutorial. I'm going to have faith that that's the further part of the tutorial. So, but at least we're not, now we're standing on the ground, which is great. Oh, yeah, no problem, Rush. This is a, there probably is a similar tutorial at W3 schools. This one is on the Phaser IO website. And uh, yeah, I'm going through it for the first time with everyone here just so we can kind of learn together. I am going to, to skip ahead a little bit and start doing some more development. I've got a book on Phaser and I'm going to go through these tutorials and I'm going to try to get a little bit of ahead, ahead of things next time. But for right now, we're, we're doing this together. We're learning it together. So it'll be fun. Okay, now we need to create cursor keys. This is why I couldn't move, right? <laughs> Colliding is all good and well, but we need the player to move. You'd probably think of heading to the documentation, searching about how to add an event listener. Okay, I'll admit it. I didn't say it out loud, but I'll admit it when it didn't work when I was uh, doing the arrow keys. When it didn't work, that was the wrong assumption that I made. I thought it was going to have an event listener. And so that is kind of funny that it says you might think of searching about how to use an event listener, listener, but that's not necessary here. So yeah, it read my mind. I was thinking we were going to create a, an event listener here, but we're good to go. It looks like it has a built-in keyboard manager, which is great because uh, event listeners are not that hard to build. However, they're mostly the same. So this populates the cursors object with four properties, up, down, left, right, that are all instances of key objects. Then all we need to do is pull this in our update loop. So we're going to do this, and our update loop is that game loop. Remember that, that I was talking about earlier, where this is the one that is, is constantly called throughout the entire game. So it's the creator stuff. Um, this is all just basically run once as the game is created. This update loop is run all the time throughout the entire game. So we'll jump in here and actually cursors. Yeah, I think we'll create the cursors object each time it's run. We'll see if we can move that to the create loop, but I don't think that's correct. And let's just look at this code as we're dumping it in here because we're just copying and pasting code from the tutorial. If cur cursors left is down, so their event listener that they've, they've built here has an is down flag, then player set velocity X minus 160. And then we're going to play that animation. Remember the animation that we built up here? We have left turn and right. It's going to play left. So that's really cool. This is pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory code. Curious. Oh, an update function. Yeah, that's where we put it. And um, Yvonne says, curious where and how the entire loop realized in this framework. Yeah, like the entire game loop. I'm thinking it's probably on this uh, game object. It's probably where the whole entire loop is run, but we'll see. So let's let's save this. And look at that. We can now run. <clears throat> now here's a, a few things that that we can talk about as we go through here. This is that center frame of the sprite. And then when we press left, it moves left. And as you can see, it animates between those, those two little walking things. And it does the little walking thing when we jump also. And it looks like we could probably use a little bit more gravity because that seems like a, like a pretty high jump for our player, right? Da, 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 da. So this is cool. We have not written a ton of code here, right? We haven't even been here an hour, which is about how long I was planning on spending, but we, we might go a little longer. Um, thankfully, the leadership where I work allows me to go longer if I feel like going longer. Um, oh, and I see some, there's some chat in here 
on Twitch that did not come up in my restream chat. I have no idea why. That is interesting. I'll use a crow. I hope I'm saying that right. I'll use a crow. Um, <laughs> comments, but that's not the clean code way. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, so there's, there's a lot of argument out there about comments all the time. If you write your code clean enough, you don't need comments. I don't believe in that, and I'll tell you why. So I've been a developer, and I think you're, you might be saying this sarcastically, which is fine, but <laughs> basically there's a lot of folks out there that say, if you write your code clean enough and good enough, it doesn't need comments. It comments itself. That is true. However, what can also be true is in six months, you go back into your own code and it's like somebody else wrote it and you have no idea what's going on. And comments will save you from that. So basically, I like to comment code. In production code, I try to comment it just to be nice to my neighbors, right? Anyone else that's gonna be jumping in and writing code too, I wanna be nice to them and say, hey, look, here's this thing. And sometimes the comments say, uh, this is a little hacky and I'm really sorry. But, but a lot of times they'll say, this we're doing because of this. And yeah, I'm a believer. And Higmoto416, first time chat. Thank you for coming in and chat. Which IDE? I'm using WebStorm by JetBrains. I don't know if I'm gonna stick with WebStorm, but I'll tell you why I really like WebStorm. I like Visual Studio Code too, and that's where I do a lot of my JavaScript programming is Visual Studio Code. <clears throat> I like WebStorm because it enforces good code in some ways because there'll be things that I'll write out and you'll see all these little warnings come up. It's all right there. Um, it does some pretty cool code completion, things like that. Um, and you can press this little button and run HTML pages, which is kind of nice. So in Visual Studio Code, what I'll do is open up a console and type serve or something like that. Um, but I've just found that for a lot of things, it's just really complete. It's kind of like Visual Studio versus Visual Studio Code with C Sharp. You can write C Sharp in either one of those, but sometimes Visual Studio Code has a more complete package. I don't know if I'm gonna always write these in this IDE. I might just go back to Visual Studio Code because um, I have it configured. I have it really where I like it, but thank you for the question and thank you for the chat. So for one reason or another today, uh, my Twitch chat is not showing up in Restream. And maybe I'll check and see here. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like I've got, uh, it, there really isn't any settings that I could see that are preventing it. So, okay, I'll just go and check. <laughs> yes, I'm recording. Um, Rasha, I'm recording this and it'll be available on Pluralsight's YouTube channel. So if you're not able to watch this whole thing or if you came in late, recording is here. And it'll be under All Hands on Tech Live. So there's recordings of my streams and David's. This is pretty cool. I mean, I feel like this is a lot of progress in an hour. So we're gonna keep going. <laughs> Although we've added a lot of code, it should be pretty readable. That is true. The first thing checks to see if left key is being held down. If it is, we apply a negative horizontal velocity and start the left running animation. So that's what we're talking about. It's doing two things at once. It's doing the animation where it's flipping between those two um, parts of that sprite. And it's also moving the sprite as it goes. So it's two things at once. And then he says, do comments because people do not know why you wrote that module, but for some methods, when variables describe themselves, you don't need to comment. Ideally, good to use some tools which allow you to generate documentation. You are absolutely correct. Um, and I should have mentioned that as well, that um, especially like building an API, I will always do comments in an API so that I can put in those uh, put in those comments to generate documentation. And so that's another good reason to use comments is to use documentation. However, as you mentioned, I don't like to uh, put comments on every single variable if it's super obvious, especially. 
So the prayer, player sprite will move only when a key is held down and stop when they are not. Phaser allows you to create more complex motions with a momon, momentum, I don't know why I couldn't say that, momentum and acceleration. But this gives us the effect we need for this game. The final part of the key check sets the animation to turn and zero the horizontal velocity if no key is held down. So it goes to turn, which let's jump in the code here and see, turn, that's frame four. So that's that middle frame here. Um, we had it open. Hello, JHNSV. How are you today? First, first time chatter, which is cool. Uh, love it. So we've had a lot of .NET and Blazor stuff going on on, on my stream. And uh, so now I'm trying to do something it's a little more like David's stream, right? We're all JavaScript folks, so be sure to follow if you like JavaScript stuff. So this is that, uh, as soon as you let go of the key, it stops moving and it stops animation and it just puts this little character here. And then these are the ones that are used for animation moving on after that. So pretty cool. And if anyone has any questions or anything, feel free to jump in the chat and ask. And if I have an answer, I'll give you the answer. If I don't, then we'll find it together. We'll Google or Stack Overflow or whatever. So the next part of this tutorial here, the next part that we're looking at, it looks like And once again, I would love it. Everybody followed us on Twitch. Twitch is where we stream all of them. I mean, we sometimes stream on other stuff, but we mostly stream on Twitch. And if you want a sticker pack, if you want these cool stickers for your laptop, send me a whisper on Twitch. And, uh, you know, just follow us, send me a whisper, and I'll shoot you some of these cool stickers. I am able to shoot them to other parts of the world too. I've, I've noticed I was able to ship them internationally, so that's cool. So jump to it. The final part of the code adds the ability to jump. I thought we were able to jump. Oh, okay, yeah, I was gonna say, it's, we're not adding code, but the final part of the code adds the ability to jump. The up cursor is our jump key, and we test that if it is down. However, we also test if the player is touching the floor, otherwise they could jump while in midair. So that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Happy Valentine's to you also. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone has cool plans for Valentine's Day. Uh, even if you are single, that you're going and doing something to take care of yourself, right? I mean, that's, that's what I've done in the past. So, yeah, we're not able to jump in midair. We can only jump if you're touching the ground. That's interesting because that's probably like the first cheat somebody would come up with, right? They would come in here and be like, oh, let's see if I can just jump and make it go all the way through the sky. But you can't do that. You can only jump if you're touching a platform. So that's collision detection. Um, so far, you know, when I was looking for a uh, JavaScript framework, game framework to start with, I saw so many good reviews about Fa Phaser that I just decided, okay, Phaser's the first one. And so far, I'm really impressed with this. This is not a ton of code that we're using here. So it's cool. It's awesome. I love it. Now, if both these commissions, conditions are met, we apply a vertical velocity of 330 pixels a second squared. Okay. <laughs> the player will fall to the ground automatically because of gravity. With the controls in place, we now have a game world we can explore, load up part seven and have a play. We don't need to load up part seven because we built our own, but try tweaking values like the 330 for the jump to lower and higher values and see the effect it will have. Definitely. So this is the factory 330. Let's try uh, changing it somehow. Uh, 330 is that value that we were looking for, and that was gravity. Uh, where did I put it? I know I put it in here somewhere. There it is. 
Oh, this is uh, this is our jump right here. Cursors up is down, and player body is touching down. So this is our jump. So I should probably throw a comment in there. This is our jump function. <clears throat> Let's add a thousand to it. Oh, you can't see that screen. Now I can see the screen. Perfect. I jumped to it. Look at that. We go all the way to the top of the screen. So I just added a one. So now it's 1300 instead of 330. Now here's what I would do if I were making this game and we're trying to make a game. We're trying to make it challenging and interesting. Let's go back to 330. Here's what I'll do. And this is a little, little game design tip. We want to make it as close as possible to not being able to jump on there. And I'll explain. We'll try 300, which might be our magic number, might not. But we want to make it so that the player can barely jump onto there. We don't want it to be too easy. And that's the whole point is, like, you don't want to make these these games too easy because then they're not going to be challenging. You got to torture the people a little bit. That's what I was saying last week. Like love the player and want to torture them. So you want to give them a good experience, but also torture them a little bit. So 310 makes it a little harder. Let's say 305. But we want to make this so it's not just an immediate, like, oh, I can jump up on there type thing. And this one, yep. So I'll go over here and see there, the player is not able to jump on that one. So we went a little, little too far with it. Or we, had a, we would have to move that platform. Because now, oh no, that's perfect. Okay, so that's what I was trying to achieve. I'm going to pull it down just a little bit more, but I think it's going to actually affect it pretty negatively, <laughs> if I had to guess. So we'll go here and say number 300 wasn't working, right? Let's just verify that. Three, 300 isn't working. I think, yeah, 300 won't happen. Let's try 301. There we go, 301, we can get up onto that platform. It's just pretty hard, you've gotta catch that edge. <laughs> it's happy Valentine's Day to dude. So at 301, we're just barely able to do it. So this is where I would keep it. And the reason why is if we have it so that, <clears throat> so that jumping onto the platform is super easy, then there's no skill involved, right? You can just go and jump and it's super easy. However, if it's like this and it's a little tricky, right? You can't just go up here like this and and jump and go over to it. Well, I guess you can, but you have to catch that corner and jump on. That's how you want it to be so that, so that there's a skill. There's skill involved. You can't just jump over and go like this because that won't work. It has to run and jump with that 301 value. See, they have to run and jump to each one. Now what that does is it builds a skill. So imagine your player, which right now is me, of course. I just built a skill. I just learned how to jump. Now, as I play this game for hours and hours, it doesn't matter, it's all muscle memory. But when you're first learning, I just learned a skill. I learned how to jump onto these platforms and that feels good. You want the player to have to build certain skills to advance in the game. And as those skills build, they feel better about it and you're making an enjoyable experience. So that's why I have it at 301 and not like 350, because let's show you 350 doesn't require any skill. You just go up and say, whoop, oh, no problem. Whoop, no problem. Don't have to run and jump, don't have to do anything. This is too easy. They've built no skills. So, as I like to say, love the player 
as in, you know, really focus on building something that's awesome for them to play and fun for them to play. And uh, also love the player but want to torture them a little bit. Make it difficult. Give them challenges. Give them stuff to, to overcome. And I'm checking. Oh, Jay Langstorff is raiding with a party of 98. Thank you so much. That is so cool. I was actually watching that stream earlier this morning that Jason was working on. That is so cool. That is awesome. Very cool. CM Griffin G. Oh, that's another person that I follow on both here and my personal account. Um, that is awesome. Thank you all for, for coming in here. That is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you're great also. I really enjoy your streams and, uh, uh, I'm really surprised at how much you do, like how much streaming you do. It's really impressive. Like the wild consistency and, uh, very interesting stuff. So <laughs> very cool. I'm really glad to have you all here. So today we're, um, since a lot of you are probably here for this raid, today we're learning how to build JavaScript games in Phaser. Haven't missed a day since October trying to see how long I can go. I believe that because I've seen you on there so many times. Haven't missed a day since October. That's incredible. Just incredible. Uh, if I could stream th three days a week, well, I'm doing it two days a week now, but if I could do it like three or four days a week without messing up, I'd be happy. But every day since October, even Christmas, New Year's, it's awesome. Very cool. So we have gone through, that is really cool. So we've gone through this tutorial here and said, you know, there in the tutorial, it suggested that we that we change this velocity. And I think that we did like tweaking that 330. I think 330 is way too easy. I think making it 301 puts a little challenge in there. I say that as I can barely jump onto the platform myself. Um, so yeah, we tweak the lower and higher effect. And if people are interested in this, um, oh, thank you. Uh, if people are interested in this code that we're building right now, it's all available at that phaser IO tutorials. And so the changes that I've made have been very, very small. So I don't think I'm going to put this on GitHub like I usually do for a lot of stuff because, uh, we haven't changed a lot, but we'll build some cool custom stuff and then we'll throw that on GitHub for other people to, to jump in there and modify stuff. So it's time to give our game a little purpose, it says. Let's drop a sprinkling of stars into the scene and allow the player to collect them. So this is pretty exciting. All right, I wasn't even sure that we were gonna get this far um, into an actual game. I figured we'd have a little player move it around, but this is cool. To achieve this, we'll create a new group called stars. So we we learned earlier what those those collision groups are all about, or those physics groups are all about collisions. Um, let's drop a sprinkling of stars into the screen and allow the player to collect them. Heck yeah! To achieve this, we'll create a new group called stars and populate it. So this, I believe, will be in the create. Yeah, it's in the create function, and we'll add this code. So let's add this in here. Stars. And we've got some, we've got some code in here that we don't really understand, right? That I don't understand. So this tutorial will explain it, of course, but we have stars, it's a physics group. We know what a, a physics group is. We know that the key is star, so it's gonna load up that star um, image right here. We know that that's one of our assets. Repeat, I'm assuming, I'm gonna make an assumption that it's repeating creating it 11 times, setting the X and Y, though I don't know what step X means. That's probably so it creates it at different, uh, different places on the X axis, maybe? We'll see. And why is my uh, big physics any void function return values used? Hmm, that should should work, but it looks like my IDE does not like it. 
<clears throat> in the inspection. But we'll see. Oh, I see that. 70 is like an offset, it looks like. Step X, probably like a 70 pixel offset for each of those. And audio context. So these are all warnings. Today we're ignoring warnings. I mean, we're not always ignoring warnings, obviously, but today we're ignoring warnings because we're new and we're just learning how to do this stuff. I'm also ignoring my IDE warnings, by the way. Um, but yeah, it's because we're learning. Now here's gonna explain that set XY, right? Or no, this is set, Set X, Y, we're throwing in the vector. This can be used to set the position of the 12 children the group creates. Each child will be placed starting at X, 12, Y, 0, and with an X step of 70. This means the first child will be positioned at 12 by 0. The second one is 70 pixels from that, 82 by 0. The third one is 152 by 0. So that was, we, we assumed that that was the case. And it is, these are 70 pixels apart. So it just goes from the previous one and says, every 70 pixels will create a new one. Cool. Um, what's another piece that we need to look at? Random Y bounce value between 0.4 and 0.8. Where does it do that? Random bounce value. Did I forget to put that code in? Because I didn't see that. Oh, right here. Stars, children, iterate. Down here. So this is pretty cool. It sets a bounce value, so it's a little bit different between 0.4 and 0.8. And it just says float between. So since it's a float, we could get really precise with that. That is pretty cool. Oops, go back in here. Um, yeah, set the bounce Y to random different stuff. Now, groups are able to take configuration objects to aid in their setup. In this case, the group configuration object has three parts. It sets a texture key to be the star image. We saw that. Any children created a, as a result will all be given the star texture by default, which is cool. I'm sure you can override that, but that's pretty cool. Then it sets the repeat value to be 11, which is actually gonna make 12, which is cool because we start at zero, right? So it creates one child automatically, repeats 11 times, we'll get 12 in total. Sweet, the final part is set X, Y. We looked at that earlier. So very cool. If we were to run the code like, like it is now, the stars would fall through the bottom of the game and out of sight, which is exactly what they did. So to stop that, we need to check for their collision again. So we're, we're once again using a collider object. Where we put this collider object, I'm assuming in the update loop. Isn't that where we created our last collider? Or, no, we created one here, so, so it is gonna be in the create loop. So we're gonna create a collider for stars and platforms. As well as doing this, we'll also check to see if the player overlaps with a star or not. So overlap is, um, again, we're jumping into collision detection. Don't really know a lot about how collision detection works in phaser, because like I said, this is my first day using it. Um, however, the overlap is, is a pretty common function that's done in collision detection. It basically, like you've got two images sitting like this, are they overlapping? If they're overlapping, then we're colliding. That's pretty much as simple as, uh, as it gets. Of course, in code implementation, it's not always that simple. So this physics add overlap. I'm assuming that we're gonna to wanna to put this one in our update loop because it's something we're gonna to wanna to check all the time, right? So if we just put it in the create loop, then it's gonna check that one time for overlap. This tells Phaser to check for an overlap between the player and any star in the stars group. If found, they're passed to the collect star function. Okay, and I see where that's called out. So let's go to here and let's create our collect star function which takes in the player and the star now, I'm not sure why it takes in the player as a input parameter but it takes in the star and disables the body 
So now let's run this again. And oh, look at that. We've got stars is not defined. So that's going to be here in stars. So that would make sense. So maybe it is uh, just in the create where you add that overlap. Because I feel like they, uh, whoops, there we go. And still not quite. Stars is still not defined. Star. Why does it not like this particular statement here? Void function return value used. I don't see it returning anything. Stars, collect star. All right. So we're, we're running into a little bit of an error, and that's fine because we're going to figure it out. <clears throat> we've, got a, we've got our colliders added, and that collider should be below stars anyway, but... I'm going to put this up here because I don't think, let's see, this physics, where are we creating that physics group? That may be part of our problem. Now, if we put the stuff in the right order, which is what I didn't do before, this physics add sprite. Physics add static group. Okay. It looks like it works. But we had to change the ordering a little bit. Let's see what happens when we collide. It disables the star. So part of the point of this game, you know, this is like a Super Mario Brothers or something, right? We're just going to run and collect all the things. Ding. Perfect. And I'm assuming we're, at some point we'll put in a counter in there or something to count how many stars you've grabbed. <clears throat> but we did a we added a group, the stars group here, in a key of star repeated eleven times, step seventy, so it's seventy pixels apart. And then here we drop them with different bounce values, and I want to change that a little bit. I want to make the, the bounce values wildly different just to see what that looks like. There we go. See, that's chaos. These bounce values are all over the place. It's a little extreme, but just wanted to see what that looked like. I would say maybe nine. Okay, that's, that's still a little bit. That's like manageable chaos, right? a little bit of chaos instead of a ton of chaos and I'm going to check uh, chat very cool thank you all for watching today this is uh, this has been a lot of fun having a lot of fun doing it and I've been pretty excited about creating JavaScript games for a while David Neal and I actually had this conversation a while back and I was doing, you know, a lot of the Blazor and .NET stuff, which I love to do. It's really fun. But uh, David Neal and I were talking and, and I was like, you seem like you're having a lot of fun. And I am not a JavaScript game developer, but I would like to be. And maybe I should just do a stream where we learn this stuff. And so, yeah, I'm just glad to be doing it. It's cool. It's fun. Now it says the star has its physics body disabled and its parent game object is made inactive and invisible, which removes it from display. <clears throat> so I'm not really sure what that exactly that means. Has its physics body disabled? So and its parent game object is made inactive and invisible. Oh, I see. So once we touch it, then the physics body is disabled. It's inactive and invisible and removes it so we can't see it. Very cool. Hello, Bedford. Hobbyist game dev and huge Pluralsight fan. Thanks. Uh, 
yeah, it's okay if you didn't catch it earlier because we do have a recording of it going out on YouTube. So uh, David and I record our streams. So we stream on Twitch, but then we stream it out to YouTube and Twitter and stuff like that. So we're uh, so we have backups basically. If you if you come in really late, you can come and check it out. And a lot of people do. I get I get probably more emails from people that watch our the stream after it's already been streamed. So that tells me that it's a valuable thing that we keep these. So there are two final touches. I'd, I'm pretty surprised that uh, we're, we're getting all the way to the end of this thing. I was only going to do an hour, but let's, let's just finish this thing out. Uh, this is really cool. So there are two final touches we're going to add to our game. An enemy to avoid. That's what I was hoping for. An enemy to avoid that can kill the player and a score when you collect the stars. So I was hoping for that also. First, the score. To do that, we'll make use of a text game object. Here we create two new variables, one to hold the actual score and the text object itself. This score text is set up in the create function. So we're going to put this in the create function. Add text, 16, 16, score zero, font size, etc. That almost looks like... Uh, CSS, basically. So 16 by 16 is a coordinate, coordinate to display the text at. Score 0 is the default string to display, and the object that follows contains a font size and fill color. Very cool. By not specifying the font, we'll use phaser default, which is courier. All right. Let's, let's start putting that in. Uh, so it doesn't say where to put these variables here. But we'll just put them in the create function for now. Or maybe, yeah, we probably should make these global to the to the app. That makes sense. Because we're going to access it from outside of the create function. So, But we will add this into the create function way down here at the bottom. Uh, if we collide with star. So I'm really surprised the amount of code that we've written uh, today in this hour and 23 minutes to build a whole game is not very much. This is not a lot of code, folks. It looks like it. And of course, we've copied and pasted, but you know what I mean. Uh, that's not a lot of code to do all of the things that we're doing here. So that tells you the amount of abstraction in this library is great. And they're making it really easy to create games and build stuff. Let's just see what this looks like. There's my score. Score equals zero. So cool. That is uh, very straightforward <laughs> stuff right there. Um, I wonder if I could just drop in CSS in here too and it will... Uh, do it, but we'll we'll mess with that later. So here's our score text. Obviously, we need something to increment that score, keep track, and that's where collect star comes in. Next, we need to modify the collect star function so that when the player picks up a star, their score increases. So we had that star disable body true. All right, so every time we collide, it disables the body. Now we're just adding this here, so we're just adding 10 every time, and then redrawing the score. Set text, it says. So here's collect star, where we disable the body. Score. Um, so this is an increment operator here, basically saying whatever the score is, add 10 to that. And then set text. So I'll put this in the comments too, why not? Whatever the score is, add 10. Set the text. All right, let's see if that works. We've got our stars. 10, 20. We've got some of these that are still bouncing. So this is this is an official uh, integration test here of this. 120. Ta-da! That's awesome. That is uh, very cool. <laughs> and yeah, you mean it takes a lot more time without this library. If we were trying to do this in vanilla JavaScript, 
we maybe would have an image loaded and a platform loaded by the, by this amount of time, maybe. Um, but yeah, having this here, this library is definitely abstracted a lot of stuff for us, which is cool. And of course, we're going to want to go outside of that. Like we're going to want to, you know, we don't just want to rely on on their abstractions and just do everything kind of as a tutorial. We want to do our own thing. And we want to make this smarter. Like if it's JavaScript, we want to organize this in a way that it's going to be really easy to understand and modify. And that is part of what we will do on this stream for sure. We'll uh, we'll try to implement some best practices in there. And, and we're not really as concerned with performance as much as being friendly to the next programmers and yourself. So part 10, bouncing bombs. And if you're not following us, follow us on Twitch. We always stream on Twitch. We sometimes stream to YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter and all these places, but we're always on Twitch. And if you send me a message on here and say, send me some stickers with your address, we'll send you some cool laptop stickers. Um, many of these were designed by the other person on this team, Mr. David Neal, who does the stream on Thursdays. So you can catch my stream. You can catch David Neal's stream, who actually knows a lot about what he's doing with JavaScript games. And yeah, be fun stuff. I'm going to actually pull him into a stream, and we're going to do one together at some point here. But <clears throat> So in order to round out our game, it's time to add some baddies. So we have to add some enemies, right? And that'll add a nice element of change to the game that was previously missing, for sure. So when you collect all the stars the first time, it will release a bouncing bomb. And the bomb will just randomly bounce around the level. And if you collide with it, you die. Sad. All of the stars will respawn, so you can collect them again. And if you do, it'll release another bomb. So this sounds fun, right? It gives you a challenge. Get as high a score possible without dying. So now it's, this is starting to turn into a real game, right? So earlier we were drawing a bunch of squares, and then we we're doing a little guy walking around. And now it's an actual game. The first thing we need is a group for the bombs and a couple of colliders. So we're adding another physics group. This is something we've already done twice here. Three times here we've added a physics group. Not that new. We're adding a collider. Also not new. Um, and then we are, looks like we're adding a couple of colliders here. So we've got one for bombs and platforms. And then one's for players and bombs. And as you can see here, we have hit bomb, which is going to be a function that we're going to call... I'm assuming, yep, right here, hit bomb, and that's going to change everything for us. So this all goes where? I'm going to guess create, in our create loop. So let's close some of these a little bit here. So this is our create group, or create loop, I should say. <clears throat> so bombs, this physics add group. We're going to add collider, bombs, platforms, etc. Um, I'm assuming this draws them. I don't know. Don't think so though. No, because it's it's up here. So that that bomb is that one that's going to be chasing us around here pretty soon. The bombs will of course bounce off the platforms if the player hits them. We'll call the hit bomb function. So we'll throw in hit bomb here, and that one can go right here below collect star. Hit bomb, so if the player hits the bomb, then we have a problem. Uh, let's go back here. So far so good, but we need to release a bomb. And I should, I should, instead of dumping this stuff in here like this, we should look through the code and see what it does. So we know about adding two colliders. We added a physics group, a group of bombs. We know how to add colliders, but what does this hit bomb do? Well, it takes in player and bomb. And it says this physics pause, which I'm assuming means just stop all collision detection, movements, everything. Player set tint. So I'm going to make an assumption and say that it changes the color of your player to a dark color or a different color. And then it says player anims play turn, which we know from earlier in the stream, that means the player is going to be facing us. So it's going to play an animation where it faces us. And then it says game over equals true, 
which is obviously a flag to kill the game. So that's that's what we just dumped in there, which is which is perfect. We need to release a bomb. To do that, we modify the collect star function. So in here, this is what we have right now, is we have star disable body. So whenever the player collects a star, disables the body, increments the score by 10, then it sets the text to the new score. That stuff we all know works. So it looks like we're adding a new statement here that says if stars count active true equals zero. So, Count active, I'm assuming, is a method that's built within Phaser that says how many stars are on the screen. Uh, and if it's zero, then stars children iterate child enable body true. Now, I'm not sure why it looks like it will generate. Oh, I see. So if there are no stars, then we'll generate a bunch of stars. And then we're going here of our X player, and we'll just dump this in so we can look at it in our IDE. In collect star. So iterate child. I'm going to pull some of these spaces out. There are far too many spaces. If player X is less than 400, it looks like we've got another random between 400 and 800, 0 and 400. So that's that's something we're going to have to rely. I'm not really sure what's going on there. That's something we're going to have to rely on the, the uh, tutorial to explain to us, right? That'll be cool. Bomb set bounce to one. We know what the bounce is. Select collider world bounds true. So that means we, we're going to set collision detection between the bomb and us. And we're going to set the velocity of the bomb. Oh, so this could be what these random numbers are. Is we're, uh, we're setting the velocity here. So this bomb's probably just going to scoot all over the place. As soon as you collect all of them, it says, that's when, that's when this bomb gets released. So let's collect all of them. Dink, 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 dink. I actually didn't read far enough into the tutorial to see if we needed to do anything else. There's the bomb. And look at that thing. It's like bouncing around all over. Let's let it hit us. Oh, there we go. It turns me red. Now game over is true. I think we need to add that into the loop. So we do need to finish this. <laughs> we use a method co group called count active to see how many stars are left alive. If it's none, the player has collected them all. So we use the iterate function to re-enable the stars. Okay, that's where I was confused. Because I was kind of wondering, like, if we've collected all the stars, why are we regenerating them? But that's part of the game. Like, you've collected all the stars. Here's some more stars. Here's a bomb. Perfect. That makes sense. Next part of the code creates a bomb. First, we pick a random X coordinate for it. Always on the opposite side of the screen to the player, just to give them a chance. Well, that's awful nice of them. So... They're basically, we're, we're just picking a coordinate that's far away from the player. So that's something, you know, if we do level difficulty, right? Like level two, three, as the difficulty goes up, you could generate that bomb closer to the people. Easiest way to win is not collecting the stars. <laughs> the funny patch is to change the star with cigarettes and bombs with a cancer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um... Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. That would be pretty cool. Um, so changing this stuff is pretty easy. We just change these PNGs, basically. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty easy to change this stuff. So we count active, then results a nice little bomb sprite that rebounds around the screen. Small enough to be easy to avoid at the start, but as soon as the numbers build up, it becomes a lot harder. So we get a lot of bombs as we as we go, and it says, and our game is done. I thought there would be a if game over, kill everything type thing, which, I mean, it kind of does. It shuts the physics off, right? So we can't do anything, but we should at least like play a game over screen or something. So this is our game where we just try to, uh, try to get as much as we can before we die from the bombs. So I'm just going to run through and play for a minute here. 
There we go. And now I see this bomb. And now I have to watch this thing out of the corner of my eye, right? And see how it's a little bit difficult to jump on that platform. It's not, it's not super easy. Here we go. Now it's getting a lot harder because now there are two bombs that I have to watch with my little eyes. And let's go under that. Here we go. This is getting a little tricky. And I should probably publish this this game somewhere so we can play it. Oh, yikes. Getting really close. And now we've got three of them. I don't think I'm, I'm going to last much longer here as I'm playing this demo game. Woo. Oh, look at that. Once it gets in here, it gets pretty treacherous, right? So this is pretty cool. I like it. Oh, and I'm dead. So 440, that's my score. Beat the top score. <laughs> so there isn't much uh, more we can do with this tutorial today. And like I said, I wanted to, I was going to try to do it within an hour. Ended up going a little over, which is perfectly fine. Uh, and we were able to, to play around with things a little bit and make an actual playable little game. It's pretty cool. So what do I want to do for future streams? So we got a bunch of new people who rated our stream today. If you haven't watched it before, this is going to be a series of stuff. And one of the things I'm going to do is go through all these phaser tutorials and we'll learn this stuff together. But I really want to jump pretty quickly into just making our own game, our own original game. Ooh, I walked right into that, right into that one. So fairly quickly, I'll probably, maybe we'll take this and make some modifications to it. Some things I could think of are if you've generated a bomb a few times, uh, the bombs start to get bigger or more random or faster or something to really increase the difficulty. Now, I say that uh, after I just got killed after like three bombs, but, you know, the more your player plays this game, the better they are going to get. So you want to increase that difficulty and increase those skills like we talked about earlier. Any skills that are required, we want them to build those skills and have them so that they are a skilled player and they enjoy themselves. So we've got two of these now and they're all over the place. That's a great question. The bombs do not appear to have collision to themselves. So Yveni is asking, they appear to be able to collide with themselves just fine because I have seen some overlap and yeah, it doesn't seem to affect them very much to collide with each other. Oh, that's right. I got to go over here. See, once again, we're building those skills. I got to go over here. Then I have to run and jump in order to get these. Oh, that was so close. So close, but I got, I got hit. So first time chatter. Welcome very much. Uh, very cool. Higmoto says, I think adding a timer would be fun to add in with the score as well. Make it more competitive for player to player. Yeah. <clears throat> um, a timer would be uh, very useful because with those stars in there, like you'd have to... Um, Someone mentioned in chat earlier, the way to win is to not collect all the stars, right? So that's the timer would defeat that. So it would be game over if you don't collect any stars. Also, if you don't collect any stars, you don't collect a high score, but that could give a sense of urgency. You know, if you make a timer that says, hey, if this thing isn't, uh, if this thing isn't done quick, then the whole game's over kind of adds a little bit of urgency and then you can tighten up that timer between each level. So I think it'd be fun to um, 
iterate on this game a little bit outside of the tutorial. Like as soon as we start to build up some more of those phaser skills, uh, we start to to uh, iterate on this thing a little bit and just make a a wilder, more fun version of it. Let's see if I can get in here without getting hit. I'm gonna try to get more than three bombs in here. And down there is a place that you do not want to be. Uh, down in that lower level, once the bomb gets in there, it just starts going fast. Okay. Jump over here. And uh, here's my high score. Probably shouldn't have even said that out loud. Oh, and I missed it. And see, that's why I intentionally set that jump height to just be like the bare minimum. You should just have the bare minimum ability to jump. Okay. Oh, <laughs> 440 seems to be the top score, man. Ah, what do you do? So this has been really fun. So this is the stuff that we've covered today. Introduction, kind of loading assets, world building, platforms, player, we added physics, we added keyboard controls, collecting the stars, scores and scoring, and bouncing bombs, which is great. So this is, this is the full tutorial for this game. This game is fun. I think it's actually fun to play. I don't know that it's going to be something that we're going to play for hours and hours on end. I highly doubt it. However, it is, it is a fun game to play for sure. Um, so what we're going to do next week is we're going to do another tutorial. Or we're going to iterate on this game, or we're going to do both of these next week. So, um, but one thing for sure, next week we will be working on JavaScript games. So what I think I'll do is, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do a little iteration on this, and we'll change some things and see if we can, like, speed up the bombs, for instance. Oh, one thing I wanted to show, even though I haven't actually used them, is I did find a couple of tools... One of them is called Tiled. Since we're not working on a tile game, this one doesn't really make sense. But I found this, and then there is another one that I found, Phaser Editor 2D for 2D games. So this one I did load up with the sources, but I didn't really do anything with it yet, so I don't know exactly how to use it. But Phaser, Editor 2D, and Tiled are two things that I would like to dig into and figure out how they work and figure out to see if, if this will actually help us with our, uh, our game. You know, help us develop games faster. And anyway, I was going to jump in here. We're going to make the bomb velocity faster, right? So, whoops. Let's see. Let's see how this affects our gameplay here. Run through. But yeah, I'd like to do some iteration on this. Maybe we'll create our own sprite and our own backgrounds. But more importantly, I want to change the gameplay. That's the big thing that I want to do. Okay, that doesn't seem to have increased the velocity of the bomb like I thought it would. So I'm probably just looking at it wrong. <clears throat> but yeah, I'd like to next week I would like to do a little iteration on this game, a little bit of changes, and I think that would be plenty of fun. But for now, we've got through all 10 of these. I didn't think we were going to, but we got through all 10 of this making your first phaser 3 game. We made our first game. It's really cool. Um, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and I posted the URL in the chat. Now I would like to see, uh, we're going to raid somebody. So this doesn't really uh, mean much to the folks that are watching on LinkedIn or uh, YouTube or anywhere else, but on Twitch, we're going to raid somebody. So I do want to say thank you very much for everybody who joined us today. Let me see. Who of my friends are online on Twitch today?
And it looks like Coding with Luke is one that we are coding garden. Next JS. Yeah, let's do this one. So we are going to raid Coding Garden today. Uh, really cool streamer. Really cool stuff. Pretty similar to what we're doing here. So again, thank you everybody for joining. We're now going to raid on Twitch. And I will see you all next week. David Neal is streaming on Thursday. Also building JavaScript games. So be sure to follow us. Be sure to check it out. And be sure to send me a whisper if you would like stickers. Thank you all, and I'll see you next week.